Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending this latest FX Market Leader Series webcast, Settlement Risk is on the Rise, What to Do, sponsored by CLS. In this webinar, we'll, we will be going over several key areas around why settlement risks have become such an important issue for the FX industry and the wider business. We'll be looking at what impact it will have, what steps regulators are requiring market participants to take, and finally, what models market players can adopt to further pre prevent these risks. My name is Joe Parsons. I am the Deputy Editor of the Global Markets Desk here at FX Markets and Risk.net. And I'm joined by a fantastic lineup of post-trade experts to discuss this increasingly important subject. So to introduce uh, our, our webinar speakers, we have Lisa Danino Lewis, Global Head of Sales for CLS Group, Sandra Lyali Van Scherpenziel, Executive Director and Global Head of Cash for Banks at UBS. Tom Owens, a Director at BNY Mellon. And finally, David Reed, Global Head of FX Prime Brokerage for Deutsche Bank. Thank you all for taking part in this discussion today. So addressing FX settlement concerns has, has emerged as a top priority for both regulators and the, and the industry. So much so that following the Bank of International Settlements Triennial Survey in 2019, which indicated that a lower proportion of trades were going to payment versus payment systems, we have seen changes to the FX Global Code to address some of those concerns. BISCPMI also launched a consultation at the end of last year, calling for thoughts on existing, planned or possible future solutions to expand the use of PVP for a wider range of transactions. So I'm sure we'll be go, going over some of these issues throughout this session. Um, but Tom, I'd like to go to you first, really, to set the scene. Um, do you see the rise in settlement risk as an impediment for the FX business? Um, and what are your primary, what are the primary areas where risk remains in the market? Sure, thanks, Joe. I'm happy to be here. So I think in short, yes, I think this is a potential impediment. Um, impediment is a, a pretty negative word, but I think perhaps appropriate, um, you know, as a, a settlement risk person uh, thinking about this in, in the counterparty space, I view that as really a subset of the overall concept of counterparty credit risk, a very specific, very unique component of it. And I think generally what the industry has seen is a, a much heavier concentration on how we monitor counterparty risk, um, particularly when you think about events in the <clears throat> last 12 to 18 months of, of some pretty high profile uh, defaults leading to substantial losses, I think was a pretty meaningful reminder that that this risk is is real. And I think following a period of rather benign conditions, we got reminded very, very quickly that these exposures can be, can be very large. Um, so I think to the extent the market can help refocus on that and, and continue to try and remove some of the settlement risk in, in the infrastructure, it'll be less of an obstacle for the, for the growth of the industry than the effective operation of the industry. Um, where does the risk remain? I think there's really two subtopics kind of within that. One is the less controllable aspect of it, I'll say, and currencies that we all know aren't, aren't eligible for, for PVP. Um, you know, I think we've all, as people in the industry, been focused on particular jurisdictions lately where that's uh, very relevant. Um, but I think the, the more controllable aspect and where we still see a ton of volume traded bilaterally is, is about access and, and uh, market participants still choosing to settle uh, bilaterally and take that risk. Um, and like I said, I think the period that we kind of experienced, I would say between 2010 and up, up until you know, maybe two years ago was one where taking counterparty credit risk and settlement risk was uh, very acceptable. Um, and there's a lot of momentum, I think, behind that approach. And settlement methods and operational procedures tend to be pretty sticky, but I, I think you'll you'll start to see that, although a bit slowly, uh, start to change as people uh, begin to think about this a little more carefully and and take lessons learned from the last, uh, let's say, 18 months or so. So I think we'll come in and out of this topic as we go through, but I'll, I'll stop uh, my view there and see if anybody else had a, a view to share. If I can, just from the CLS perspective, you know, it's interesting that the BIS note that that rise in PVP, we do continue to see um, growth 
in the service now, as Tom alludes to it, obviously is a, a subset of the currencies and there is growth um, for you know, risk outside of those currency pairs. In December last year, we actually had a record day through CLS. So we saw $15.4 trillion uh, go through the service. And that is on the back of a, a funding requirement for our members of just 72 billion. So 0.5% uh, that actually needed to be funding. So we're still seeing a, a pickup of those CLS currencies. Uh, last year, again, a record uh, high average daily volume going through the system of 6.19 trillion overall, which was up from the pre-pandemic high of 5.89 trillion. So, you know, there is there is business coming through on those uh, on those currencies. We are seeing, though, from a product perspective, uh, some areas that remain outside, predominantly around the cross-currency swap area. And we have seen that uh, interest pick up, uh, certainly from our members, in that, in that side of the business. So there is more flow coming through there, but I think more to do. And as Tom alluded to, definitely, you know, for those currencies that are outside, uh, that still remains something that we are, we are looking into to see if we can solve that for our members and our users. And I think, uh, Lisa, by the way, that the report is also showing that there is a case for, you know, for the need of additional CLS third parties or CLS members, right, on those main currencies but also on the growing, let's say, currencies outside of CLS. So I, I think the, the banking industry needs a bit of both. That is to say, more members joining the CLS communities on, on the major currencies to mitigate the settlement risk on those. And then a, a system on a PVP side for other currencies that can be complementary to it, because the system can only be as good as, you know, the, the more members are there, the, the, the better for the benefits for, for the community itself. No, that's right, Sandra. And I think, you know, that's a really good point in terms of the new growth we saw, actually over 90% of the, the new growth last year was from third parties, but we need members to support that business coming in. Um, that's definitely an area of opportunity, I think. Okay, excellent. I, I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll go into that um, a lot more detail. Um, but Dave, I'd like to go to you next as well, because we would be really interested to know, um, you know, what these... How, how how important um, settlement risk is when dealing with with, with your hedge fund clients, um, and especially given um, some of the market events that we've seen over the past sure. sort of year or so. Um, yeah. It'd be great to get your perspective. No, I mean this. I mean particularly in the in in the hedge fund space, but really across the whole of the of the client universe. You know, this is this is a, an, an area of critical, um, you know, critical importance. And I think particularly, as we've alluded to already, the, the structural changes that have, that have occurred in the, in the FX market and the enormous growth in, um, you know, in, emerging, in emerging market currencies uh, in particular has, has led to um, this expansion of, of you know, what we might term non-CLS non -CLS settlement. Um, so you know, we're constantly, and, and across the industry, you know, we're, looking for ways that we can mitigate this, this risk. And I think that, um, you know, some of the projects that we're involved in with, you know, with CLS around um, increasing the scope of uh, the PVP infrastructure, um, and then looking at how we broaden that into, um, you know, into the true, what you might term client space away from just the interbank market um, is, you know, these are, I think really the next, you know, the next really big steps that, you um, that as an industry we're going to we're going to have to take, but I, I think um, you know Sandra, your point around the you know the growth of of the third party CLS market is really important. That um, there is perhaps a need for you know it, what you might term sort of flexibility of access. I think at the moment one of the challenges that we have is that the you know the, these these um, processes that we build are very you know they're very Big institutional processes, um, and and that's you know that's quite right that they should be that because that leads to stability and security. Uh, the challenge is how we broaden that to give this greater sort of systemic security as well, uh, without losing what is the if you like the core of the you know of the of the platform. Um, so I think those are the sort of challenges that we you know that we that we we face as a as an industry. Um, whether that's in, in hedge funds, whether it's in real money, or even in the in the corporate space, you know, how do we 
you know, where where you know real settlement risk exists, as well as um, obviously at the core of this in the interbank uh, in the interbank market across currencies that are you know that have been and continue to be challenging um, uh, at the moment. I just add one other consideration, Joe. I think as a risk professional, something we're always thinking about is not just how you measure and monitor, but what are the tools you have available to you if things were to deteriorate? And, and as Dave mentioned, the, the emerging markets uh, growth that we've seen is, is one where the credit deterioration process, the default process is a lot less transparent than it may be in, in other more developed areas. So I think it just you know, further adds to the, the risk associated with that, with that flow. And I think, and we would possibly come on to this earlier, but one of the other things that is really quite challenging in this is that particularly in the, in the emerging market space, the, although the, you know, in a sense, the end product has commonality, the reasons for that, for the problems are different. So the, you know, currency A has different reasons for fragility than currency B. And, so, and there isn't really, what you, you have to be careful about sort of think coming up with a one size fits all solution that isn't actually appropriate for all the individual, you know, individual markets that you're looking at. And that's, that is really, I think, one of the bigger challenges in this. Never mind, you know, obviously time zone, et cetera, et cetera. But there are just really different underlying reasons why there's, you know, some currencies, never mind counterparties, have got risk characteristics that make them, you know, make them more fragile. Yeah, I think we've, you know, we, we're constantly asked by our members and our clients, you know, what's the next currency that's coming on board? And I think Dave sort of hits the nail on the head there. You know, there's so many considerations when we look at the broader spectrum of currencies that remain outside. You know, what model is optimal? Is that a multilateral? Is it bilateral? You know, it won't necessarily fit within that one system fits all settlement as we currently stand. And we have to look at the account structure there, the legal framework, finality, which is a core of CLS settlement, you know, how do we come up with a solution that has that flexibility in a way that, that Dave alludes to that's necessary for those currencies? Because we have to treat them very individually, I think, just by their own nature. And I think, Lisa, also the, uh, the effort of CLS Bank to move also outside of the eligible CLS currencies and start developing additional solutions such as CLS Net, for example. CLS Net can be the, the fundamental, a fundament, right, for a, a PVP solution for those currencies that are not part of the, of the CLS eligible framework. And I think really looking at the compatibility of such, um, you know, different channels uh, are very important. I mean, as, as Dave was also mentioning, the, in certain jurisdictions, the volatility of the currencies are presenting us with challenges almost on a quarterly mm -hmm. basis. And if you look at those processes, they make the whole front to back process of, of chasing, forecasting the risk, you know, and, and looking on how to mitigate more complex, uh, while CLS would be supporting a certain automation and, and streamlining, right, STP of those uh, processes, not to speak about liquidity and cost, which interest claims can also, you know, raise mm -hmm. out of, of those situations, just to bring it to a more operation practical uh, level. Fantastic. Um, I'll be really interested to know um, about any sort of recent, actual recent examples where um, settlement risk has really been highlighted um, and maybe the experience that CLS has had um, in dealing with this, um, you know, we mentioned about sort of emerging markets um, and those maybe volatile, um, that may be a lot more volatile than, than maybe the G10 one. Um, and specifically, you know, just an example, sort of the Turkish lira, which, which was extremely volatile at the end of last year and, and, and the beginning of this year. Um, so is it, well, I don't know, maybe Tom, um, you know, have you, did, would, did you see um, any real sort of spikes in, in, in settlement risks or settlement failures at all during that time? Yeah, I'll say, I'll go back to the early stages of the pandemic. I think as, as volatility in the market always spikes up, the, there's a higher correlation to, to failures. Um, you know, I, I don't have anything specific in terms of, you know, major losses that I, that I want to highlight, but I think generally speaking, the attention and the focus and uh, the amount of time that gets spent on the topic has certainly increased, particularly, as I mentioned, in, in Turkey previously, I would say, you know, the same conversations had going on in rubles. 
um, over the last week and in, in, in month, perhaps. Um, so I think it, I think the focus is certainly there. I think uh, the volatility leads to more concern, but uh, I'm open to any other specifics people, folks want to get into. I think volatility per se is not necessarily, you know, the problem. It's it's fragility is the problem. You know, so when you have a particular market that is either you know that has the challenges of saying before around say time zone or some of the things that are compounded around certain markets like um, you know that are one day settlement, these these lead to greater problems um, of of greater problems of settlement and higher levels of risk and the higher levels then of potentially knock-on problems where, you know, a payment, a failure from one counterparty leads to, or a delay leads to a delay that knocks on into, you know, into other counterparties um, and creates funding issues. And, and you know, as, as Sandra said, you know, leading to increased costs and problems that can kind of propagate across the, you know, across the market infrastructure quite quickly in some of the, you know, in some of these smaller markets. And again, this goes to what I was saying before around the, the problems being, you know, what are the underlying causes of, of the problems in certain currencies? Um, and how do we mitigate those um, in order that both clients within those countries and the broader global market can, can participate for you know the real needs that people have of doing transactions this is not just around sort of you know speculative transactions but around you know making real payments that are required for commercial you know commercial need um it leads to can lead to you know substantial problems in you know in these in in some of these markets and i think these are these are the you know the things that we're trying to resolve um, uh, uh, underneath a broader umbrella of across the industry how do we how do we shrink this problem um, that's, I think, Tom, you mentioned, you know, we've been through a fairly benign period of time where, you know, perhaps the focus has been more on, you know, if you look on a fairly long time period, you know, focus on G10. Now we've gone to an area where we're focusing, you know, where there's a great deal of focus on, um, on uh, emerging markets, great deal of volume there. And, and perhaps, you know, an industry-wide infrastructure that's not necessarily fully attuned to that shift in, shift in balance of, of, of volumes, et cetera. Okay, perfect. Inter really, really interesting. Um, and, you know, Lisa, it would be great to know, you know, what, um, you know, how CLS kind of, what was their experience um, during these times of, of, of volatility, especially maybe in those um, EM currencies? Yeah, well, I guess, uh, Joe, for CLS, you know, we touch on some of the, the, I guess, the bigger emerging market currencies, but we don't cover the likes of Turkey, we don't cover the likes of, of Russia, etc. But, you know, again, our members have, have raised these issues that both Tom and, and Dave and Sandra alluded to, and we are looking and working with the market to try and solve uh, that problem. Um, you know, is there an alternative PVP mechanism uh, that we can we can provide for the market that helps alleviate some of these issues. But as Dave alluded to, you know, it's it's got to be more more tailored to the specific currencies than the, the the existing system that we have that obviously covers eighteen all under the same set of standards. Um, local market participation is is critical in these markets. They are very dominant, and 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 their um, the requirement to have them as participants is important. And again, under the, the current CLS settlement, given our regulation and our framework, uh, the membership rules are very strict and, and the criteria is, is very, very robust. And I'm not saying any other system would be less so, but I think, again, we have to bring in that element of, of flexibility to make sure that we can cater for that local market. We need to have you know, the, the local central bank support and engagement in these currencies. There's a lot of of work that needs to be done in order to facilitate this, but it's something you know we've been looking at very seriously over the last year, eighteen months, um, with the hopes that we can help the market in solving this problem. Super. Um, okay, so I'd like to just lead us into the next um, part of this discussion. Um, and so, so last year, the, you know, the FX Global Code um, 
released its update and it underlines um, the regulatory and market focus on mitigating settlement risk. Um, I mean, this is the current sort of principle 35. That, I mean, they changed it to say that market participants should reduce the settlement risk as much as practical instead of taking prudent measures. And they do set out um, the, 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 that firms settling FX transactions should use um, services, services that provide a PVP settlement where available. Mm. Um, so, you know, maybe following that release, um, Lisa, I'll, I'll come back to you. Um, you know, have, how have you how have you seen uh, the industry react to this, and how impactful has has the code been to, to yourselves and and to to, to clients um, to you know really adhere uh, to this um, this guidance on assessment risk? Yeah, thanks, Joe. Um, I think it has been very, very uh, impactful to the market. The, the updates, interestingly, at the beginning of this year, we started to see and have more dialogue with our members around what business they have that still remains outside of CLS that they could potentially bring in. And I mentioned earlier about, for example, the cross-currency swaps and that sort of principal final notional exchanges there, which they're looking to bring in. So we've seen a renewed interest there. But interestingly, we've actually seen a number of our members come to us and want to discuss ways of us helping them to help their clients to come back, to come onto CLS and, and in, increase that PVP. And this sort of comes back and links into some of the points that we've already talked about, you know, increasing that third party participation in the system and how we get around that and how we improve that. So we are working very closely with a number of our members to help them directly, indirectly educate their clients on, you know, what the service can bring, what those benefits are, you know, help it, how it helps them adhere to principles 35 and 50 of the global code. Um, and again, you know, broaden that scope. I think, you know, we've seen one of the biggest areas of, of growth and participation in the third party space, or the, I guess there's two really, which is the, the smaller regional banks and uh, the asset manager, the real money community, are very, very active participants in, in CLS. Again, some of the challenges we have are around, I think, the corporate market. And that's, again, goes back to the discussion we had about uh, credit capacity at our members to support that. Um, but certainly we're working with our members to, to help and to educate uh, on that, to, to, again, raise the awareness amongst that community. And I think, again, having a, a register uh, for the Global Code, we've seen a lot of uh, renewals of those adherences coming in on the re revisions um, of, of recent dates as well. Perfect. Thank you. Um, Sandra, maybe uh, I'll, I'll come to you next as, as well. I mean, sure. um, how did you um, respond to maybe what the ethics code, the, the, the updates um, to that and what it stated about assessment risk and how have you kind of passed that on to, to your clients as well? Yes, I think the regulatory pressure, uh, especially in some jurisdiction, has driven uh, clients to look very actively at CLS as a solution. And if I may compare to 10 years ago, you might have looked at banks mostly joining uh, the client segment banks CLS only if their main domestic currency was part of the CLS set, right, of currencies. Mm -hmm. Today, it's different. Today, you would also see jurisdictions and markets that are more emerging, let's say, moving into a CLS membership as a third party, so through a settlement member, and at least eliminating, you know, the settlement risk mitigation, having a benefit of that in those main currencies. And I think that is a big change that we've seen in the in the past five to 10 years uh, in that regard. So the interest is really rising across regions in some more than others, but you see also new markets coming into it. The FX code of conduct with the two articles you just mentioned before has raised more and more attention. So you see also a lot of treasury departments, you know, raising it proactively uh, as a topic. And if I I look at the four main drivers for let's say a client a, a client segment like banks for example to join CLS there are four main uh, benefits they look at it's the risk mitigation aspect we've mentioned now through the discussion because there there is also a lower capital requirement for the banks when you when you have a, such a centralized way of settling you know those currencies so the bilateral settlement actually is associated also with larger capital needs and and costs related to that the netting benefit I mean, not to underestimate liquidity has a cost today, mm -hmm. a cost of equity, you know, market, market cost in terms of uh, liquidity 
cost in the market for certain currencies in particular. So having one simplified payment per currency to make either as a disbursement or funding has a huge benefit from a treasury perspective. And if you can, as a bank, quantify that benefit, you will see that there is quite a strong business case also to move into, into the CLS uh, space. The FX business expansion, because obviously you become a counterpart part of the community who can trade potentially even more, right? Because there might be more credit appetite towards certain, certain uh, counterparts. And you might also find new counterparts within the community with whom you weren't trading before. So we also hear that uh, it, it brings FX business ex expansion as well for the banks. And last but not least, the operational efficiency front to back, which should also not be underestimated. I mean, CLS offers a very simplified way also of settling the netted positions that are due in the market or from the market and that has a huge benefit for for banks as well so when we look at the client base in the third party space um, financial institutions they might also have branches of the same group that they want to onboard as a fourth party so there is also a fourth party layer to that but uh, we've seen also you know funds being segregated and settled via via CLS uh, asset managers looking at it and selective CCPs apparently as well. So quite a, an interesting story, I would say, for different client segments and jurisdictions across the globe. Definitely. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks very much for that, Sandra. Um, so, yeah, as, as we mentioned, you know, CLS is working with member banks to explore alternative PVP settlement models for currencies that are currently not eligible for CLS settlement. Um, Dave, will an alternative PVP solution really help tackle the problem in your perspective? Well, I think it will. The, you know, what we're looking for here is ways really institutional, you know, look, as banks, we all settle all of these currencies with our clients and with each other um, all day, every day. That's what we're doing right now and then the question is how do we you know is there a way that we can bring you know across the industry and as an institute you know for institutionalize these processes in a way that recognizes perhaps that they don't fit within the core cls um you know the the, the, the core cls uh of the paradigm but um but nonetheless can be part of a, a, of a sort of a broader broader family of products that um that that, that can reduce risk and and um, you know, enable perhaps all of the things that um, you know that Sandra just mentioned. Those sort of four four factors. Now, I think that these um, you know this this uh, the work that that's going on with with uh, with CLS, the, the expansion of these these um, uh, the PVP model um, is you know is is really tremendously valuable. But it's it's a necessary response to the. Um, you know, to the concern, if you like, that the regulators have expressed around the growth of this, uh, the growth of this problem. Um, and I, I think that, you know, the presence in the global code of the statements that you just mentioned um, are, are exactly, you know, uh, exactly part of that, that broader, you know, broader response to a regulatory, you know, a regulatory concern. So, you know, as an industry and as a you know a primary provider in this in this in this space, I think it's incumbent on all of us and CLS as our primary provider to be able to come up with you know with products that help mitigate this this broader risk that extends beyond the you know the 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 frontier that that CLS has normally operated in. Um, and the more that we can create a the more that a unified ecosystem can be created. Um, then the greater the risk mitigation that we can achieve across that across that ecosystem. So the you know the more utility like it becomes, the fact that we can then start doing this in a you know in a much more efficient way with fewer payments starts bringing down the risk, and that's for the you know that that works for for us as banks. It works for the industry as a whole, and it works for our clients, which is you know the really what we're trying to achieve here. Um, and it's obviously an output that the regulators are. You know, clearly very determined to see. Um, so those are the, you know, those are really the drivers for this. And the, you know, the underlying product that we, you know, that we're, we're looking at um, is, you know, something that we're, you know, obviously the industry is working very closely on with, with CLS at the moment. 
And I think Dave right, uh, raises a really good point there around that sort of that netting or that network effect that's super, super important for any solution. Um, realistically, what we want to move or the market wants to move away from that bilateral risk and, and benefit from that multilateral uh, netting efficiency if we can. So building any solution with that network is super, super important. That's something, again, that we've been we've been discussing over the last 18 months or so, how best to do that and what needs to be in place to facilitate that. You know, FX is a, is a sort of inherently very fragmented, um, fragmented industry globally, um, clients, client-wise, et cetera. And anything that can be, you know, that starts to expand across all of those boundaries and bring things together to achieve this, these sort of, you know, centralization effects, I think are, are you know, it's, 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 it's hugely important and it does have, you know, other drivers. So better capital treatment, et cetera. These are things that are really important and becoming more and more important in FX, um, uh, you know, whether it's with treasuries or it's, you know, costs within, cost, just straightforward costs of doing business, never mind the pure risk element, um, you know, the pure risk element to this. Excellent. Uh, and Tom, as well, you know, maybe just uh, off the back of what Dave and Lisa um, mentioned there as well, what, what are your thoughts, thoughts on, um, uh, you know, the importance of alternative PVP and, and kind of the importance of a, of a network solution could have on, on, on the FX business? Yeah, I think any, any industries, any, any businesses' ability to, to grow and accelerate is obviously linked to the infrastructure that's there to support it. Um, as Dave mentioned, FX is, is very different from, you know, say the, the treasury market or even the agency MBS market where that infrastructure has been in place as, you know, using a CCP model that's really allowed it to become extremely liquid, extremely efficient. Um, so it's clearly different, but I think the, as Dave said, the ability for clients to access the market, um, you know, in a clean fashion hinges very much on the, the industry's ability to to recognize the, the many benefits, not just on you know risk mitigation, but the funding and uh, and the treasury. So, you know, I think <clears throat> more PVP is is always is always a good thing in isolation. You've got um, you know risk coming out of the system, but if you had you know multiple, I would say sub utilities operating independent from one another, the fuller benefits that we we talked about. And Lisa talked about at the at the top of the call in terms of you know volume versus funding requirement. You, you don't capture the the greater benefit. Um, I know this is a settlement risk you know related topic, but the you know, the bigger picture of, of of things that we'll take advantage of um, is something to keep in mind as well because there's there's obviously huge advantages to that. I was reading a, an article over the weekend actually, which which highlighted some some interesting facts, and it was talking around the Mexican peso, which. Uh, joined uh, CLS uh, quite some time ago now, but they were talking about the compound, compound annual growth rate um, and mentioned that in the first five years after joining CLS, the Mexican peso uh, trading expanded over 22%. And again, a similar number around the Hungarian foreign uh, in the years 2016 to, to 2019, uh, it grew something like around 18% joined CLS in 2015. So I think that you know, mitigating that risk, taking, giving the market that security underneath and underpins these currencies and allows the market to have more confidence in trading. Obviously, we've, we've also talked about, you know, that impact of, of introducing that assessment risk mitigation on, on credit and how that helps to extend it out as well uh, in that space. But I thought that was a, an interesting way to look at it. Again, you know, if we look at the FX market, going back to the early days of CLS, uh, you know, we've been in existence now for 20 years. The FX market was around 1.2 trillion average daily volume in the early 2000s. And now, well, we've got the new BIS coming out later this year, but in the 2019, 6.6 .6 trillion. So, you know, again, grown considerably. And I think the more we can do, uh, you know, not just CLS, but as a market to mitigate that risk, the more growth potential there is uh, for the ecosystem. Yeah, I think it's, it's clear that every market participant will have a different appetite for settlement risk. So when you remove that variable from the equation, it's, it's just a, a huge equalizer to allow, you know, a lot more access and a lot more relationships that may not have otherwise been possible. Okay, super. Um, and, you know, Lisa, you talked about how, um, you know, 
how this can be applied um, for, for across, across the board. It'd be great to know a little bit more about the cross currency swap offering. I mean, how can what was the kind of um, are there any unique hurdles and challenges that the cross currency swap markets um, face when it comes to PVP and and um, anything any kind of specific um, you know, changes that that, that that need to be made to you know, bring that under scope. Yeah, sure, Joe. I think uh, look, the cross-currency swap service that CLS offers at the moment is only open to members. So it, again, we were talking about broadening participation. We have you know, more of a limited uh, scope there. But I think even within our members, there are some, some challenges. And I think predominantly that's because uh, generically cross-currency swaps usually sits under the rate side of the business. And obviously CLS is very much driven by the FX side of the business. And, and as we all know, you know, and the others can speak more to this as well, that normally rates and FX don't generally use the same uh, back office, middle office support systems. So the challenge really for our members to put their flow into CLS is to, to link up their rate systems to their FX infrastructure and get that flow of information through to allow that trade then to, to move down and go through a CLS and, and go into the PVP. I mean, from a benefit standpoint, uh, we find that actually normally the addition of cross-currency settlement, uh, cross-currency swap flow actually increases the netting efficiency of our members. So there's definitely a lot of advantages just from that side of things, but also from a funding of obviously bilateral settlement of cross-currencies, they're usually very large notionals. So that makes a difference as well. But I think, you know, the, the, the challenge that our members have is making sure their systems talk to each other. If they have that, then it's fairly straightforward to get that, that flow through. So it's not, you know, from that perspective, it's sort of business as usual. It's just that internal link. And I don't know if, if Dave, whether you've got any more sort of insight into that. I know um, uh, that that is one of the challenges, I think, because of those uh, operational sides. Yeah, and look, it's very much a, a problem across the industry. This is a problem of our own making, if you like. You know, this is a problem that, uh, that uh, uh, you know, much as we hate to say it, you know, silos exist within banks. They they are very much, as you say, you know, the rates world operates on different platforms off, very often to, um, you know, to FX. But settlement is settlement risk is settlement risk. You know, and ultimately, the institution is facing the same sort of risk across this, irrespective of where the, you know, the underlying um, flow, if you like, come, comes from. Uh, so I think it's really important that if we have a desire to, you know, to remove settlement risk or reduce settlement risk rather, um, that we, you know, we bring, uh, we figure this, you know, we figure this problem out and we bring this into the, we look at, we look at settlement risk in a, you know, in a much more holistic way. And I think banks are doing that and figuring this out. Um, but in many cases, it's really, you know, it's definitely a non-trivial task to kind of, Come over the, these these walls and and ensure that the at a at a sort of perhaps a treasury level or a funding level that we're bringing all of these things in to one place and um, and achieving the appropriate efficiencies. It makes you know absolute sense to do so, um, but it's um, you know there are equally clearly there are, you know there are barriers you know barriers to that, but barriers that need to be uh, you know that need to be overcome. Um, but it is, you know, it's very much something that I think that is being worked on, I know, across, you know, many, many, many banks. Um, and I think there'll be, I'm sure, it's, you know, you're probably close to this than me, but, um, you know, many banks will be getting, getting to this point, and I think probably sooner rather than later to, um, to achieve this goal. Yeah, I, I think, again, that, um, that firming up of those principles 35 and 50 in the code, that regulatory sort of focus and lens on assessment risk has, has made, you know, traditionally those that have just focused on FX look further afield. And, and, and definitely we've seen that, that pickup of conversations across our members on that cross-currency swap side. So I, I think that's gonna continue into certainly this year and next as we look to remove where we can, you know, PVP from the market or the settlement risk rather on the market um, and I you know I think as you say you know some of these you know the numbers involved just the sheer numbers involved in the cross-currency swap space in particular are, are you know really really meaningful so these are big reductions in there's a lot of you know in terms a lot of bank for the buck available if you like in 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 that particular area excellent um so 
I like to, you know, the, the, we, can, we mentioned it earlier as about um, direct and, and third party offerings um, to CLS settlement. Um, but Sandra, you know, I'd like to come to you next. Um, how does adding direct and, and third party um, settlement services benefit your business and, 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 and also your bank clients? Well, I think it's um, the aspects that we also mentioned in the discussion, particularly the, the risk, the credit risk also um, aspect related to it, right? The optimization of usage of credit lines and expanding the business. So what Lisa just mentioned before with the example of Mexican peso is a development you see also with a CLS third party that once they join the community through a a CLS third party provider, they get access to a broader community of, of counterparties to trade with. So I would say that those two aspects are definitely uh, primary in terms of, of for banks to, to move in. We see that in the main decision making process, you usually have treasury uh, counterparts, um, risk, credit risk counterparts, but also head of operations. I mean, if they understand, as I, as I mentioned, the, the front to back benefit that CLS uh, brings to them and the benefit on the liquidity side, uh, these are reasons that very often drive a decision-making process for, for a bank or another client segment to, to join CLS. Now on the CLS third party, um, in terms of client segments, we've also seen pension funds looking at that. Obviously, when you look at volumes in the pension fund space, they usually have lower volumes, but higher values. But obviously, if you are the house bank of such client segments, I mean, for them, the risk mitigating factor is extremely important. So CLS uh, is um, an ideal solution for them. On the corporate space, as Lisa mentioned before as well, depending on the size of the corporate. and. Um, you know, you may think that CLS is an alternative to prime brokerage, but it can actually be even complementary to prime brokerage and open up also, you know, a broader um, trading um, sphere for for the, the client segment. So I, I think there are different, different options that can be considered depending on what fits the profile of the client segment. And, um, and, and we see the development going in, in different directions, not only for, for banks in the third party space, but also, as I said, asset managers and also funds related business. I like the standard that you mentioned operations. I, maybe we didn't give operations enough credit as we highlighted mm -hmm. some of these topics before, but you know, Dave said before, fewer payments. Fewer payments is fewer fails, uh, fewer knock-on effects, lower costs. Um, yeah, so it's it's um, there's something not to forget as we think about all the, the reasons this is helpful. Absolutely. And one of the actually another aspect and Sandra, you touched on this earlier on, actually, when you were talking about some of the benefits, you know, from an operational standpoint, you know, having CLS uh, for settlement allows you as a third party to effectively in a way outsource a lot of that settlement process and and substantially reduce sort of the internal resource and focus that's needed to, to look at all of that post-trade work. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a substantial, there's obvious savings for CLS from a netting funding benefit, but I think from an operational perspective, yes, we've got, you know, hope less settlement fails or, or none, hopefully, uh, you know, a, a lot less uh, of a challenge around reconciliation, but we've also got resources that you can reallocate to other areas of the business because they're not needed to look at that traditional sort of post-trade workflow that you would have with bilateral. Many of our asset manager clients, you know, love the fact that it literally, it's in CLS, they don't really have to think about it again. Um, and there's, a, you know, there's a huge benefit from that, knowing that you've got that security, certainly from the asset manager space that traditionally always traded solely with their custodians or you know where where it was safe from a settlement perspective it's obviously broadened that spectrum allows them to you know ensure that they're looking at sort of best execution across the spectrum of of aspects as opposed to you know being sort of focused in, in sort of one area corporates again you know it, it helps the, the thing with i guess corporate treasuries is generally they think they they tend to have less of a, a larger operational uh, infrastructure so the more you can do to to in effect outsource that or reduce the risk and the focus that's needed 
you know, the bigger benefit for you there. And, and I think, Sandra, you, you, obviously you touched on, on the bank space very well as well. And Lisa, I actually think that also the forecasting capability of CLS for a third party is extremely important also in cases of volatility or crisis, right? Through CLS, you can actually foresee or recognize some settlement patterns or delays very fast, which outside of the CLS context might be more of a mm. challenge, right, front to back in terms of operations. So I think, and we, we experienced it all uh, in, in, the, in the past year, there have been, you know, some currency crisis or situation in certain jurisdictions and via CLS, there is quite a strong, robust framework that enables you to foresee and, and to act promptly on the situation. And I think from a risk perspective, this is extremely important as well. Okay, perfect. Um, I'll be interested to know really, you know, what third party access has been like for hedge funds and corporates. Um, uh, we've mentioned that, you know, maybe the, the, the requirements um, are quite you know, tough um, you know, for, for eligible currencies and also eligible participants. Um, but, you know, Lisa, it'd be, it'd, be, it'd be great to know, you know, from, from your perspective, you know, is there a way for, for a solution to be applied to everyone um, to really access a PVP solution, you know, not just the big banks, but, you know, any kind of size of, of financial institution or corporate or, uh, uh, or hedge funds? Yeah, I mean, Joe, there, CLS is obviously where we transact directly with our members and it's our members who offer those services onto third parties. So we have, you know, as third party participants, we have corporates, we have a number of hedge funds. Predominantly, those hedge funds are ones that don't transact via a prime broker, but have direct credit relationships. Um, and again, asset managers, non-bank financials, banks, um, smaller regional banks. So we're, we're open to, to everyone. We're not, you know, um, we're not closed off there, but the restrictions really sit with our members and their appetite, I guess, from a credit perspective, uh, primarily to support that business. Now, I think one of the challenges when we look at the corporate space is, Traditionally, it would be the cash management bank who might offer CLS third party services. And if that uh, member doesn't actually offer third party services, then it's hard for that corporate who uh, has all their cash management with that bank to to access CLS. It's not saying that there aren't others outside other members who will support that, but it's a little bit more difficult when you don't have, I guess, the same oversight of the credit relationship, that depth of relationship than you would have elsewhere. So, you know, that's not something that unfortunately CLS can control. We're very much, um, you know, beholden to our members there to, to open that uh, facility up with those market participants. But certainly, you know, we are talking, we have clients from every sector, we're talking to clients uh, from every sector. There's definitely demand to do that. But I think the challenges really are around that provision, liquidity and credit space. And I think, you know, again, Sandra, you're the expert there. You can probably provide a little bit more color about some of those, those challenges. No, absolutely. Absolutely, Liz. I think the, the aspect about where sits the cash with the mandate, obviously, of with whom you are doing CLS is an important uh, is an important aspect. But there are also ways to streamline that as well, right? In terms of on, mm -hmm. on the corporate side, on the on the bank side, it's a different uh, story because obviously third party banks usually have also their Nostra providers in the different currencies, depending on the size of the currency in the different markets. But there are also ways, you know, to consolidate certain types of currencies together in order to benefit from what you're saying, that the cash is sitting also close to that counterpart. But there are also automated solutions that can be offered whereby the cash management aspect can be very much simplified in, 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 that, uh, in that aspect, absolutely. Okay, excellent. Um, and now, you know, we're getting to, almost getting to the end of this discussion. Um, and it'll be really good to talk about um, you know, people's, uh, your thoughts on, on the benefits of, of multiple settlement providers in this space. Um, you know, we're, we're seeing uh, you know, a lot of kind of the fintech side recognize um, the, 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 the new technology solutions are out there for, for for FX settlement and, and kind of solving for settlement risks. Um, so 
maybe Tom, I'll go to you. Uh, you know, what what do you make of kind of this? Um, the, these new solutions are out there, and, and do you think, um, or can B and Y Mellon run a, a multi settlement model? Yeah, I, th I think um, you know feasibility is, I think, less a concern. I think if <clears throat> you know, with enough enough time, and you know, large institutions are hard to hard to to move, but. Um, you know, I think obviously capability is is something that you know we can all think about developing if we haven't already. I think the one thing that again I think we touched on this, but comes to mind is the absence of potential absence of some of the liquidity benefits. So I know you know Treasury and, and risk professionals in the you know intraday liquidity space particularly will think you know that that adds a, a bit of a complication if you have different funding requirements at different utilities and perhaps at different times of the day. So I think that that predictability, um, you know, and the forecasting capabilities that that institutions have, knowing when they're going to pay in and, and in what amounts, um, is still a challenge there, even with multiple providers. Um, so I don't know if, if there are other thoughts on that, but you know, when I think about multiple PVP things happening, that's that's good from a purely settlement risk standpoint. Um, but I think to, to capture the floor benefits, we should, we should be thinking about and working with, you know, the, in, the industry leaders on how to how to really tie those things together, um, you know, to, to capture that fuller set of advantages we've, we've been discussing. Yeah, I echo that, Tom. I think, you know, as CLS, we welcome any new method to reduce settlement risk, but I think you have to weigh up those benefits uh, versus, as Dave mentioned earlier, that potential market fragmentation and the impact that might have on some of the, the benefits. Could it reduce the efficiency of the market and actually reintroduce elements of risk? So you have to sort of weigh up all of that, as well as, you know, the considerations we talked about earlier around, you know, technology is an important aspect and it has to be robust. It has to be, uh, you know, effective, efficient. You need to know that, you know, when there's a huge day, as I mentioned, we had a, a, a massive day in December, that it, it's, it's robust enough to stand up to that capacity. But also you need that regulatory framework around it, the legal, you know, to look at all of those different aspects um, of it. Um, but I think, again, with that element of weighing up benefits versus the, the potential fragmentation that it might cause. I think, Lisa, fragmentation per se uh, kills the netting benefit, mm -hmm. right? So, but fragmentation happens also with new fintechs coming in and bringing in new value proposition. I think you may not do a step of changing something for the sake and benefit of technology. You need to have a risk benefit related to it, right? So if we look now at, at CLS and the fact that the risk benefit is there for the community, as the more Herstadt risk you take out of the system, the better, right? So I think that the numbers of members that, that are part of it is, is crucial for the success of, of this solution, absolutely. And just to put that into perspective of scale, you know, CLS has been in operation now 20 years. We've got 70 plus members. It's taken us, you know, 20 years to get to that stage. It's not something you can, you can, you can't build that network overnight. It's always a, a slow process. And, you know, Sandra touched on uh, the CLS net product, which we launched several years ago. And again, that one's just building momentum and building scale, but these things take time. Um, so that's, again, when we look at that impact, that benefit versus, the potential fragmentation or, or the time it takes to build to scale. I think that's an important factor as well. Okay, perfect. I mean, so, so you mentioned about the fragmentation risk there. Um, you know, obviously, you know, there, there is so much net in benefits and, and the network uh, benefit of using CLS then. So, so with maybe these other um, kind of competitors and, and new kind of solutions, do you think it will be a case, or maybe it's maybe Sandra, do you think it will be a case that, um, you maybe would see these kind of transactions maybe being a bit more local, um, or maybe given for us what individual markets as opposed to something that is cross currency, um, cross network. I think they are they are happening happening selectively in selective jurisdictions. You cannot neglect them. I think it's on us really to monitor these new trends and to see which are which ones are getting a, a response from the banking industry with a new need or a new aspect, right, of, of mitigating risk. But as Lisa mentioned, the regulatory backup of these solutions is extremely important. 
So I, I think it, it needs also to have a regulatory support and backup, right? And um, to what extent some new rising solution may get that so fast, I think is, is questionable, but nevertheless, quite exciting times to be monitoring and following, you know, what, what, what is coming up. But I think after all the complementary aspect of things as we were discussing earlier on in our discussion, right? The CLS eligible currencies and then the new efforts of CLS Bank with, uh, with members to look at the PVP in emerging markets. I think to find a way to have a complementary solution for these is really the, the key to a successful, you know, uh, alternative for the market. Yeah, okay. I I think that the, you know, the innovation in general is a is a good thing, right? And um, it's it's important that we, you know, that that there's a broad variety of ideas and the sort of you know the stimu stimulus, if you like, of competition is is a good thing. And I think that equally, some there are there is easily the capability for some for for platforms to be complementary to what um, to what CLS does. Um, and you know, for it to actually, in the end, broaden you know, broaden its reach. Um, so I think um, you know, look, I, I think overall, um, the it, it it is you know, it's it's it, it is a good thing. Um, I think that you know, as we've all said, the fragmentation parts of this, the um, you know, the more utility like, the more uh, efficient funding is, etc. The more you know that that there are there are very large advantages that that, that, that brings. Um, but there are, you know, no, nonetheless, there are, there are parts of our business that, um, uh, uh, all banks that can be, perhaps, you know, there are new technologies that can be applied to that to make other internal efficiencies that flow further up, upstream. Um, I also think that, um, and perhaps it's, you know, it's always uh, somewhat compulsory to, we can't have a foreign exchange conversation without having a, you know, bringing in digital assets and current and you know, cryptocurrencies or, uh, and you know there has got to be a joining up ultimately of these markets, um, and some of these, you know, fintech, um, the ability for these fintechs to to straddle in what are at the moment these two worlds. Uh, I think will probably be advantageous in reducing settlement risk across that, you know, that that whole continuum. So um, I'm not sure that in the end it needs to be a, you know, an either or, because there's a place. Uh, I think there's probably a place for both. And that's probably the great thing that that, that, that the innovations we've seen both CLS and also the market is that, um, that this is a mutual problem solved. Um, that, that everyone's kind of realizing um, the need to, to tackle this problem, and it's really great to see um, stuff that's coming out. Um, I'm afraid we're out of time now. Um, there were some really, really interesting thoughts raised by, by everyone on the panel. Um, and so I'd really like to thank you know, Lisa, Sandra, Tom, and, and Dave for your thoughts. Um, and thank you at home for listening as well. But with that, cheers. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>